This is Word on the Streets, a podcast about the Buttles and Indian Corridor Improvement Project. This podcast is created by the City of Midland, Michigan, and produced by the MCTV Network. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 2 of Word on the Streets, a podcast about information, updates, and perspective on the Buttles and Indian Corridor Improvement Project in Midland, Michigan. I'm your host, Katie Geyer, along with my brilliant co-host, Grant Marshall. One of the goals of this podcast, as we've said before, is to share information and updates on the Buttles Project. Uh, But in the downtimes, and we don't really have much to share going on, we're going to take some time to explore topics related to the project in more detail. So right now, um, Grant, we're still pretty much in the preliminary design phase right now. Do we have any updates at this point? So not any specific updates, but it's important to recognize that this type of design and and planning for a corridor of this nature, it's rather complex. It takes a lot of time. In fact, it takes months in order for them to put together um, uh, really a 50% drawing that would allow for them to come to the community and have that first public input opportunity. So we're in the very early stages of the design process. A lot of that contains information gathering out in the corridor itself. So people may have seen some surveyors out in the corridor doing some um, detailed survey work and other things like that. Um, But that's where it's at at the moment. And I do know it's moving along and MDOT continues to have conversations internally to work through the process that they have. Um, But it will take a little bit more time until we have more information to present on to the public. Sure. I know everyone's getting really excited to start seeing uh, some of those conceptual designs. So um, we've only had about a month, month and a half since council decision. So still very, very early for us to see anything yet. But we're looking forward to to hearing about that very soon. Um, So interestingly enough, Uh, The model concept that both the city and MDOT have referenced during the Buttles Corridor project is now getting some national attention in Congress right now. Actually, as of a couple of weeks ago in late February, um, Senator Edward Markey of Massachusetts and Congressman Steve Cohen of Tennessee introduced an act called the Complete Streets Act of 2021. Um, If you remember from a couple of years ago, this is the reintroduction of a bill that originally was written in 2019 um, that's based on a policy in Massachusetts that has been overwhelmingly successful in creating safer street networks for a lot of different communities in that state. Um, So if passed by Congress, which we're still, again, in the very preliminary, um, you know, segment of that as well, just kind of like we are here. Um, This act would significantly change the way communities are able to approach street funding, um, approach road design projects, and then receive funding for those projects from the federal government. Um, So this is a pretty big deal that this is now taking center stage in our legislature. Um, But first, let's take a step back, Grant, and talk about like what exactly complete streets even means. Right, right. So a complete street is one that's designed to provide safe and accessible transportation options for multiple modes of traffic. Um, as well as people. So people that maybe are in vehicles or are walking or biking, um, uh, the whole gamut of the way that people move from place to place. Um, It also takes into consideration people that are moving of all ages and abilities. Um, The Complete Streets approach integrates people and place into the planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance of our transportation networks. And this helps to ensure streets put safety over speed, and they balance the needs of different modes and support local land uses, economies, cultures, and natural environments. Okay, so a complete street means we are thinking about everything, not just vehicles. And when you think about, you know, the um, history of streets in the most basic sense, when the first roads were really built, if you will, they weren't for cars. They were for horse and buggy. They were for wagons. They were for those slower methods of transportation. And it wasn't really until motordom really took force that we started to build these large, complex street networks that now we're taking a step back and saying, wait a minute, we've kind of ignored some of these earlier methods of transportation that really our street networks set out to initially um, provide transportation for. So um, it's an interesting concept when you think about how we have built out the street network and now we're almost scaling it back a little bit and saying you know what maybe we need to keep in mind that people don't all transport themselves by car Um, so the complete streets project uh, concept is not exactly something that's new to michigan and it's honestly not even anything that's new to midland Um, we have our own complete streets policy we passed that in june 2010 
what uh, was about two months before the state of Michigan passed their own policy in August of 2010. And basically all that does uh, for us locally is it helps guide our staff when it comes to new road design or when we're making changes to existing roads and doing reconstruction projects, things like that. Um, In August 2010, the state of Michigan passed two public acts that made the Complete Streets Approach a requirement for any future state-funded road projects through MDOT, which now, of course, includes our um, redesign of the Buttles and Indian Corridor. So we're definitely not the only community doing this. Um, We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a little bit. Uh, But I wanted to explore a little bit more about the Complete Streets Act and kind of why this is now such a huge deal for communities when it comes to street safety in America. Mm -hmm. So it's it's exactly that. It's a national look at something that states and even local municipalities have been doing for a number of years. So this is a huge deal for this to be looked at at the congressional level. Um, Ways that it would be um, impactful to the city, um, specifically the city of Midland, um, would be if this act passed, it would set aside federal funds to support complete street projects. And so it would be um, specifically earmarked to do work around that policy in individual communities. Um, It would also require states to have um, a program that would provide technical assistance for complete streets policies and programs uh, within the states. And that would also direct um, localities or municipalities to adopt their own complete streets policy. As you mentioned, though, Michigan has a statewide policy. The city of Midland has a city policy. And so we've already started to check some of those boxes. There could be some specific nuances to each of those that we may have to change. But again, this is a big deal for it to be happening at the national level. But it's also important to recognize why we're talking about this nationally, um, because there's been a lot of work that's gone up to this point. And not only is it something that's been supported by this one particular congressman in the state of Massachusetts, um, but the American Association of Planning has been talking about complete streets for a number of years. Smart Growth America also has talked a lot about complete streets. Um, Strong Towns, as as we've talked a lot about um, here in, in Midland over the last few years, has talked about the importance of complete streets But unfortunately, another thing that's driving this conversation, too, is just how dangerous a lot of our streets have become, especially for pedestrians. Pedestrian fatalities across the United States are way up over the last five years. Um, And that is pretty um, tragic. Um, And we could we could, quite frankly, do better when we're planning streets and designing streets to make it safer for all users. Absolutely. Um, So the million dollar question when we start to think about this, why would the Complete Streets Act be a good thing for communities like Midland? I mean, like I said earlier, we've already kind of been doing this at the state level. We've been doing this for about 11 years now um, at the local level. So do we really need this policy nationwide? Let's talk about that. Well, it's something, again, when you talk about the way that we allocate dollars, I know a lot of times people say, well, you can't really tell a a community's vision by their maybe their plan, but you definitely can see what their their um, um, things that they really care about within the budget. Right. And so again, having a national policy is going to dictate the way that dollars are spent, and that's going to reinforce really how we're putting our money where our mouth is, if that makes sense. So this is a really big thing to change how projects are happening on the ground in communities all over the country. But when I think about Midland in particular, I think the reason why we even passed a Complete Streets policy was because we recognized that this was a very crucial and very objective way to start to build on things like livability and asset development and transportation equity. We don't necessarily talk about transportation equity all that much, although we do talk a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion within the community, but transportation is a big part of that in our day-to-day lives. And I know we've mentioned, um, and we'll talk a little bit about in our next segment, really this concept of um, allowing for people to be able to move from place to place at all ages and abilities. There's a time in everyone's life where eventually you get to a point where you unfortunately have aged out of being able to drive. And you go from a passport to go everywhere Mm -hmm. to not really being able to go anywhere. And we've designed that into our cities. And so we have a way in which, through a very objective process, be able to improve on that to make it better for future generations so that they're not faced with those same type of challenges because there's only one meaningful mean of transportation. This is about creating other options and other variety um, that is going to make communities stronger. That's a really valid point. Um, When you think about, you know, especially with federal um, highway network and federal funding for road projects, how there is some disparity in equity and inclusion in transportation projects. A lot of times, um, especially federal highways, have negatively impacted even, you know, large thoroughfares have negatively impacted the communities that they run through. And I think that this is a great opportunity 
not only for us locally, but also from a national perspective to take a step back and say, let's start making incremental changes to make this right. And maybe that that complete streets policy is is what we're going to do to, to rectify that. So thinking about that and federal overarching policies in general, as we are um, very familiar with in, in municipal government as well, sometimes while these policies are very well intentioned, there are some additional pressures that they're put on, especially smaller municipalities and communities like ours, um, or maybe some drawbacks. So what are some of those possible issues that might stem as a result of something like this being put into place? Sure. So I think, as you mentioned, this is um, something that would be, um, there'd be certain rules that you'd have to follow. And when you add an additional complexity into the decision making process, it does make um, things more complex and a little bit more nuanced and not necessarily as straightforward as we've known them to be. But I think it's important to recognize that this is because we're changing the paradigm around the way in which we design and we build infrastructure within our communities. And it's not that just the last generation was used to one way. We're talking decades and decades and multiple generations that have been used to this motor dumb American way of living where um, we have basically planned for the automobile and have done very little to forward any other forms of transportation across the city. And so it's important to recognize that that's, that paradigm shift is not going to happen overnight. And as we've said, incrementally is really the key. We've got to take little steps to move in that direction. But of course, municipalities are, are limited in staff. We're limited in the resources to be able to pull from. Of course, we've built so much infrastructure in order to cater to the automobile that we don't have a way to pay for all of it. And we even here in, in Midland County, we have two additional millages on top of the road dollars that we already get in order to fund our, our roads. And we still have um, limited ability to be able to get to everything because our infrastructure system is just so massive and we don't have the value to be able to take care of all of it. So peeling back all of that and changing and flexing, all of that is very, very challenging and it doesn't happen overnight. And of course, it's not all done in a vacuum either. The entire world seems to be changing in a lot of ways, whether that's virtual things brought on by the pandemic or it's um, impacts of climate change um, and other things that are impacting our day-to-day -day lives and how we go about doing our ordinary business. And I think all of that, adding one more thing into that big puzzle of shifting, um, it can become a little bit overwhelming. But I almost step back and I think, okay, but let's think about really what our goals are. Our goals are to build more livability and they're to build more equity, um, 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 equitable forms of transportation within our communities. So having that as our end goal and that being our compass to move towards makes a lot of that complexity and that challenge and frustration seem not as big um, and doable because we are trying to do something that's better for the community. Absolutely. So, you know, that's a good point to, to bring up what I was kind of thinking of more on the communications and public relations um, angle, which is something that I obviously focus on. I even seeing it here locally, there is that challenge of ensuring residents really understand kind of why we're doing this. We're not just doing this for the sake of change and for the sake of, well, let's see if this works, right? We know it's not working. We, we've seen the negative impacts of, you know, large scale infrastructure projects and that they, what they've had on communities, what excessive speed does to communities, what um, some of these projects while well-intentioned at the time, no longer really fit into what we consider to be a quality of place type of community anymore mm -hmm. and getting people to understand what a complete street really is how it's supposed to function maybe getting a little bit outside of that traditional line of thinking when for years and you said decades our street policy has been to design make it as easy to get from point a to point b in a vehicle as quickly as possible and while that for so long served cities so well as we can see now, especially on the national level with the number of pedestrian fatalities and the, the issues that communities are having, um, that's just not working anymore. Right. So we're trying to take a step back and say, OK, are there ways that we can continue to meet our goals um, when it comes to vehicular transportation, but also make it a fair and equitable opportunity for everyone, even if you don't have a car, or you don't want to use a car mm -hmm. uh, to be able to get where you need to go and to do that safety. Right. safely. Well, and I do want to jump in on that one thing you said there, because I think the, th the thing we also have to recognize, too, is that this form of, of auto-oriented transit, it's, a, it's been an experiment for the last just over 100 years. Um, this isn't a time-honored, tested thing that we've been doing for thousands and thousands of years as humans have existed. And so we've really been trying to figure out if this is even something sustainable. And it's taken us 
this long to recognize, no, this is actually quite the opposite. This mm-hmm. is very expensive. It puts a lot of liability onto municipalities and to people's pocketbooks because our municipalities are funded by taxpayers. Sure. And so at the end of the day, all the taxpayers are having to pay for all of this infrastructure and there's simply just too much that we've built. So. We're, le- we're learning that this was an experiment that we thought was going to work, um, but we really got to change in order to make it sustainable long term. Sure. And I think it's valid to say that. Like, this is an experiment. There is no necessarily fault um, right. in over the last hundred years or so. You know, people um, in, you know, federal, state and local um, offices of transportation that have been involved in the planning and design of these projects and the engineering of these projects at the time that was what we did, right? Um, there's really no blame necessarily to be to be laid out. It's just um, we're starting to recognize, you know, maybe the way of doing things traditionally was working for a while. And now as we've kind of seen um, neighborhoods shift and uh, people's overall views of their communities and what they expect from those communities change, um, we start to shift and say, maybe we can find a better way to do this that's a little bit more fair and equitable to everyone. Um, so it's really important to just think about that as we continue to talk about um, road design. We're not saying that anything necessarily was done maliciously in the past. We're just looking at an alternative to the future and kind of seeing how can we best serve our community for everyone. If you want to read more about the Complete Streets Act of 2021 or learn more about it, you can find a link on our podcast website at cityofmidlandmi.gov slash corridors. Now we're going to take a quick break and be right back with our second segment featuring a very special guest. We'll be right back. Welcome back. For our next segment, we're going to welcome a special guest and a fellow public servant who has quite a bit of experience with the concept of complete streets, including a few road diets of his own. Joining us is Justin Lyons, planning manager for the city of Ferndale, Michigan. Welcome, Justin. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, So to start, for our listeners that maybe aren't familiar with the city of Ferndale, Can you give us a little bit of background on your community that might be helpful to kind of set the stage? Sure. Um, So the city of Ferndale is located just outside of the city of Detroit, just north of Detroit. Um, It's in the metro Detroit region, obviously. Um, Roughly about 21,000 population, um, four square miles. So sort of a compact um, inner rig suburb of Detroit. Um, And, you know, City's been around since the, the 1920s, um, kind of came uh, about um, during that boom um, of uh, of all the growth going around the city of Detroit. Um, and so, you know, but I think that Ferndale's kind of made their own unique mark in being a, a welcoming community. Um, definitely a sort of a bedroom community that's um, been um, seeing some growth just with more interest in, in walkable, um, semi-urban, environments interesting very interesting i know i've i've been to ferndale a few times and it is um kind of as you described it very um very accurate so let's jump into some of the good stuff that we're hoping to talk about today Um, in our first segment we talked about the concept of complete streets and how that's now receiving national attention in congress um, and becoming a more widely used concept in municipal Mm -hmm. planning Um, but the city of ferndale has actually been using complete streets for a number of years. Can you talk about some of those projects that were implemented as a result of that policy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in the early 2000s, late 90s, um, West Nine Mile is where um, sort of the core downtown of Ferndale is. And it was kind of before complete streets and bike lanes were even thought about. Um, And it was just a a project where there was a four lane road going right through the middle of downtown Ferndale. And uh, there wasn't any on-street parking. The sidewalks weren't real comfortable. There wasn't really any landscape to speak of. Um, and so some forward-thinking uh, public service at the time um, made that major adjustment adjustment to downtown um, Ferndale. And, and that kind of set the stage for the future. So um, in around 2010, the city adopted a complete streets ordinance that essentially said, you know, going forward, we're going to look at streets and plan them for all ages and abilities, and uh, which led to uh, the city's first mobility plan. And so um, we've kind of been chipping away at a number of projects since then that align with that ordinance, but that ordinance really set the the guidepost of, you know, 
this is how the minimum expectation of, of planning going forward. Um, so a lot of projects and grants that we've worked on since then have all kind of fit those those goals of um, environment and accessibility and livability and economic development. Yeah, excellent. So you mentioned some of those goals. So I guess if we kind of back up a little bit, but but sort of what's the vision that's being um, trying to be obtained as part of having an ordinance like this? Um, I think, you know, Ferndale is pretty lucky in that, you know, it's, it's a, the bones of its infrastructure have, uh, have set itself up to be um, a place where you don't necessarily need a car. Um, you can be car optional, I guess. Um, so we have decent transit that's running through um, the community that connects to our neighboring um, cities. Um, you know, it's, it's in a grid. It's, the city was built in sort of a grid fashions, uh, which lends itself to just a little bit being shorter distances to getting to and from places. Um, a lot of, you know, essential services that are in the community already. So um, I think that really when the ordinance was was made and the, the Ferndale Moves plan, the mobility plan for the community was made, it was just thinking about, you know, how can we be a little bit more uh, multimodal and give people options rather than just having to drive to and from places within, especially within a city that is only four square miles and, and, and you know, it is uh, pretty easy to walk or get to other places um, without a car. Yeah, yeah, no, that's wonderful. I know Midland is a little bit different. We're um, 36 square miles, so a little bit bigger, mm-hmm. a little bit more palatial <laughs> and spread out. Um, but I think there's pockets certainly of the city that we're wanting to um, establish that same type of vision, like you mentioned, give people options, um, create variety within our transportation options, within our, our systems, and um, and allow people to pick and choose what they want to do from a mobility perspective, because not everyone wants a car or uh, can afford to have a car or maybe has a- even aged out of being able to drive. And so, um, so I appreciate you you mentioning that vision. It's it's similar to, to the stuff that we're doing here with Indian and Buttles. Uh, nine mile um, project um, that was done a few years ago. Um, oh, I'm sorry, that was the East Nine Mile project that was done a few years ago. But can you tell us about the West Nine Mile project um, that's happened fairly recently? Sure. Um, so we've the city of Ferndale's kind of chipped away at Nine Mile over the years from its initial project way back in you know the early 2000s, and then another project that happened around 2012. Um, and so the most recently uh, in 2019, um, the city of Ferndale actually got to just uh, partner with our neighboring um, city, Oak Park. Um, so they have uh, the bulk of uh, West Nine Mile, which is their portion is between Republic and uh, connects all the way past Coolidge Highway, if you're familiar with the area. But um, so Oak Park approached us and said, hey, you know, we see the um, you know connections that you've made and, and, and safety improvements you've made on Nine Mile. We'd like to do that with our portion. We have sort of an interesting border where um, it doesn't exactly line up um, perfectly um, where people would normally think of, hey, this is for no, this is Oak Park. And so we we partnered on a grant, a grant application um, and so the city of Oak Park, they've done a great job in like essentially making a linear park and narrowing lanes there, adding more pedestrian crosswalks. Um, and so we were able to just kind of partner with that and just continue the momentum that we've had um, on, on Nine Mile. So, but I think it really speaks to um, a portion of our planning process where we, we you know, try and connect with our um, neighboring communities because when someone's riding a bike or walking um, to their job, maybe in Oak Park from Ferndale, uh, they don't really care that there's a specific border there. They just want to make sure that bike lane is there or that sidewalk is there. Um, so we think that that really um, helps the, sec- the next um, stage for Nine Mile for both communities. Perfect. Um, so now what I'm sure everyone listening probably <coughs> wants to know, and definitely what I selfishly want to know, um, what were the outcomes of these projects? What specific um, parameters did you put? What additional design elements did you include? And in your opinion, how are they performing today? I think they're performing pretty well. Um, so I think that we've been, you know, very fortunate that a lot of our, the city of Ferndale's investments uh, in our infrastructure happened along with um, the resurgence of the economy as well. So, you know, I think there's dual uh, multiple things going on um, that have kind of helped, um, you know, come together at the right time. But um, so, for example, uh, East Nine Mile, which was mentioned earlier, that project around 2015, since that project's been done, there's been, um, you know, over 250 units of multiple family housing on that corridor proposed. Um, some also some rehab buildings that have turned into restaurants and things like that. And, and more of a 
mixed use um, walkable environment. Um, I think that by narrowing that road, um, making wider sidewalks, adding some more streetscape elements, it just feels more of, <clears throat> it, slows, it slows speeds down, but also just feels more active. So I think uh, once the city made that type of investment, um, it just has made um, people realize that, oh, this is kind of an extension of downtown. Um, and there, there just seems to be more opportunity there. So um, we've seen in the past five to seven years, um, a lot more multiple house, multiple family housing development across the city in, in and walkable to areas that we've done road diets, um, but also major safety improvements. So there's a lot more attention on um, safe pedestrian crossings. Um, so we've seen you know, decreased speeds, but also decreases in crashes, um, depending on the street that you're looking at. Um, but really, I think occupancy all around has also been up in commercial buildings. And then, as I said, the residential. Um, so we think that that um, really just shows that we're committed to doing these types of improvements, improvements on all, um, all of these major corridors. And we've also made some zoning and um, modifications that have helped be a little bit more business friendly, allow for more different types of uses, uses, but also make sure that those future buildings that are constructed are done so in like a, in more of a mixed use walkable fashion. Sure, sure. I was actually reading an article not that long ago talking about the concept of beyond complete streets, but going into complete neighborhoods and how people are really starting to pay more attention to, am I close enough to a grocery store to walk? Am I close enough to some of these amenities, schools, um, other after school activities for children, shopping, dining, just being able to do these things without really even needing to ever get in your vehicle and that's something that's really becoming more popular right now and something that i know we've paid a lot of attention to in the last couple of years especially in the downtown and midtown areas so um definitely good to hear that that kind of um intuitiveness is being put into your planning process as well so having gone through several of these redesign processes now over the last couple of years what were some of the lessons that the city of Ferndale learned that you'll plan to implement in the future? Um, I think a lot of it has been centered around community engagement. And, and really we found, you know, there is never um, a, a limit. Um, and I think that each time we've done a streets and roads project, um, we've tr tried to do more each time and we've, we've gotten good feedback. Um, it's nice being in a smaller community like we're in that, um, you know, you can, you know, I'm available to talk to a resident and it's easy to set up a meeting in a neighborhood. So um, two years ago, we set up a, um, you know, community engagement process to talk about how we were going to redesign West Marsh, West Marshall to be more pedestrian and bike friendly. Um, and so, you know, we heard in that, in that process, you know, it, some of the ins and outs specifically what happens day to day on that street and how um, it connects with neighboring bike routes and things like that. And so people gave us preferences of where they wanted to see trees and where they wanted to see uh, bicycle parking. And so I think just going more to the community is what we've tried to do. And so um, we've really seen that um, updating our mobility plan. I mentioned earlier for Dev Moves, we are just about um, the final draft plan is like it just published um, last week. And so we did a variety of different ways of outreach of between focus groups to one on one uh, meetings with uh, adjacent communities and then a lot of zoom meetings obviously um but but we've gotten great feedback that way um and then also you know it's not just an a, instead of just throwing out a survey and hoping to get results um, we were able to do um you know different uh, multiple different outreach points and, and got a variety of feedback so i think you know that's probably the main learning um experience i would i'd also say you know um the more data that you can get beforehand, the better. It's it's very easy for us to get after data, but um, there's some times where I wish, you know, we would have gotten a little bit more before data before projects completed. But um, I think that we've built a lot of those things in our process um, for future. That's great to hear. I know we've certainly had a lot of lessons learned when it comes to the community engagement piece with this project that we're uh, working on here with Indian and Buddles. And so it's happy to hear it really makes me happy to hear that you've been able to implement a lot of that and evolve um, to do better as you go forward, which is certainly our, our intention as well. Um, switching gears a little bit, uh, talking about a specific project that you guys are continuing to work on, and that is involving a possible lane reduction project with MDOT, um, the Department of Transportation, and it's on a state trunk line in the city of Ferndale. A lot of similar elements to the project here with Indian <coughs> and Buttles. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about that project? 
Absolutely. So um, Woodward Avenue in, in, in Ferndale um, has a lot of history to it. It is, you know, really the, the, the first, I mean, not just Ferndale, but Woodward in general is the first, you know, highway in, in, the, in the country. Um, it's seen a lot of different iterations over the years. Um, and, you know, I'm not the first person to have worked on the project, but it's been really more of a regional project um, over with our neighboring uh, communities like Pleasant Ridge and City of Detroit. And so um, we've had an ongoing conversation with the Michigan Indoor Department of Transportation for years um, and then found out that um, Woodward was due for a uh, road resurfacing project. So basically just a maintenance project where, you know, new asphalt and some ADA um, improvements and some joint repairs and that's that's it. Um, and so we had worked with our local Oakland County uh, Transportation uh, Service Center uh, staff at MDOT to, you know, see how, what can we do to, to um, include, you know, some of our community goals and Pleasant Ridge's community goals into this project. And so we did what we went through, um, what MDOT calls the road diet checklist, um, which has a lot of engineering requirements and traffic data and, um, you know, make sure that you have a community or a community um, complete streets ordinance and things like that. And so we went through all these different um, requirements and did safety studies and a lot of community outreach. And so now we're to the point where, um, MDOT really said, you know, we care about what the community context is for a project, even though it's a state trunk line, we care, you know, what the local community thinks. And so if you go through this checklist and get appropriate feedback, um, you know, we'd be happy to work with you on incorporating these elements into their larger projects. So we're, we're thankful for that partnership. We're to the point now where um, our city council approved a, a conceptual design. And so um, we also are applying for a, a grant called a transportation um, alternatives program grant, which is money at the federal funding that's sent through um, the state of Michigan and, and SEMCOG in our region. Um, and so we're applying for the grant and we hope that we're successful. Um, it is very an expensive project, as you can imagine, for a roughly a uh, mile and a half to two mile road diet on a trunk line. Um, but uh, we, we're hopeful that, you know, we can get the grant funding and do uh, some bike lanes, taking a lane on Woodward uh, for bike lanes, but also really most importantly to shorten pedestrian crossings. Um, Woodward is kind of like having a um, small highway going through our downtown. It actually does split our um, downtown district in half. Um, and so, you know, we, we hope that this grant will be, um, you know, received well by the committee. Um, we've had a lot of regional and community support for it. Um, a lot of community engagement with our businesses and most people um, really are pretty, f they, they're kind of tired of the status quo of what word is, what word is right now and hope to make it a more complete street. So that's our, that's our hope and goal for um, next year. That's exciting. You guys are living through maybe the next iteration of what, where we are right now. You're about a year or two ahead of where we are at least. And that's really an exciting thing for us to think about because so much of what you have done with this Woodward project are the things that we're just starting to get into with Buttles. And um, at the end of the day, the goals are pretty much the same, which is shorten those mm -hmm. pedestrian crossings, slow those vehicles down, and really create that sense of community instead of having what is effectively a highway running right through the middle of a commercial corridor and even neighborhoods to some extent. So that's really exciting to hear that you guys are just a little bit further ahead than we are. We're still obviously a few years out um, from getting that uh, to fruition, but it sounds like you are definitely on the right track. Um, so thinking about what we've kind of learned and now what we've all learned holistically about the pandemic and has changed so much of how we approach even day-to-day -day life, how are you keeping these conversations moving given the current pandemic restrictions and, and everything that we have going on right now at the state and even at the federal level? Uh, it's definitely a challenge for sure. I think, you know, I imagine you're going through some of the, the same things and, you know, uh, with, I think, you know, Zoom fatigue and, and trying to meet people where they are is, is very tough. And, you know, it um, it does take extra effort, I think, to reach out to some other um, folks that may not be online. And so, you know, I think um, we have just been, we've just known that Woodward is, it, it's, it's a, it is a big project and a lot of work, but um, our team is just kind of um, and the community really has continued to push and say, we want to see change and now is a time for change. And so I think, 
you know, we're just trying to keep a, a balanced approach and open mind. And so, you know, when, when someone, when a senior reach us, reaches out to us and says, you know, I, I missed that meeting. Can you, you know, spend some extra time and, and talk through why this is a good idea? You know, we're open to that. So I think, you know, we're just trying to be flexible um, to try and get to those goals. And it seems like, um, you know, what I've seen at the Bottle Street Project, you know, you're doing the same. Yes, absolutely. I think it's it's definitely been um, challenging in the last year to be able to, to make those connections. But you're right, um, Justin, it is important to make sure you make that extra effort for those that maybe aren't online or don't have the um, the access to Zoom or some of the other mm -hmm. virtual or, or digital means that we've become so much more accustomed to over the last year. Um, you also mentioned that road diet checklist, and mm -hmm. I have probably an, an idea that some of our listeners may be wondering, has Midland gone through that same checklist? And yeah, yeah. they have. Um, MIMDOT does go through that with any jurisdiction when they do projects mm -hmm. like this. And um, the things you mentioned on the criteria of that, that checklist, um, they've gone through and ensured that this project is adhering to that same thing as well. Yeah, it's a pretty pretty extensive process, especially behind the scenes. Um, I am clearly no planner, as we have already gone through a few times. Um, but just to kind of see all of the working parts um, that maybe residents don't necessarily get to see all the time. So that's part of the, the point of this podcast is to talk about those things in more detail and hear from other people that are kind of more on the other side of things. Um, a little bit further down the process than we are to, to see what that looks like. Because there is definitely light at the end of this <laughs> Uh, lane reduced tunnel, let me tell you. Um, so you can find out more information on all of the projects that we have talked about today at FerndaleMoves.com. And we're also going to link to that website on our podcast website, cityofmidlandmi.gov slash corridors. Well, Justin, thank you so much for taking time to be here with us today and discuss your projects. We appreciate it so much. And we look forward to seeing great things coming out of the city of Ferndale again very soon. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Uh, also, just wanted to say, I think the Bottle Street project, um, the information that I saw on the project um, really does seem like you've listened to the community and paid a lot of attention to um, all the requirements that MDOT has and just and just smart, smart um, transportation design. So just I think that the homework you've done, I think, is probably more than more than, um, you know, most would go through for a specific project. So. Um, really looking forward to see how that project turns out for your community. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Well, that's all for this installment, but we will be back next month or maybe even sooner if we have breaking news to report with more information on the design process and next steps for the Buttles and Indian Corridor Improvement Project. Until then, see you soon and slow down. This has been Word on the Streets, a podcast created by the City of Midland, Michigan and produced by the MCTV Network. For more information on this podcast or to learn more about the Buttles and Indian Corridor Improvement Project, visit cityofmidlandmi.gov corridors.